Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for coming out on this rainy Saturday to uh, hear my presentation, and uh, I have books available as well. Um, I just want to tell you one little story about my grandfather. Um, when I was born in Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, my father was a, a professor and director of the George Washington Carver Research Foundation. Uh, Ned and Nell uh, traveled through the segregated South in 1955 when I was born. Um, they got there. And my parents told uh, them that they were going to name me um, Dave Merriweather Henderson. My grandfather was tired. He went to bed. <laughs> Next day, he stayed in bed. My parents got worried, and um, they called the doctor. They used to have doctor uh, house calls back then. And uh, the doctor came and said, well, I don't know what's wrong, but he seems to be very ill. And so my parents got together and said, well, maybe we should reconsider. We haven't named anyone for uh, my grandfather yet. So they said, we'll name him for Grandpa. We'll name him uh, Edwin Bancroft Henderson II. So they went up to tell the news to my grandfather, and he immediately threw the covers off, went downstairs, got something to eat, he was fine. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> uh, my mother always told me that I was the apple of my grandfather's eye. Uh, there are many pictures that we took. I'm sitting on his lap, at least until I became too heavy for that. Uh, and um, when I moved into his house here in Falls Church, uh, um, I had an event. I went up in the attic, and uh, I found a box. And in that box, what I found was the contents of his file cabinet. And ergo was my, um, my roadmap for writing this book and for getting him into the Basketball Hall of Fame, which we first nominated him in 20, uh, 2005. And then finally in 2013, he was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame for introducing the sport of basketball to African Americans for the very first time on a wide-scale organized basis. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, but there's so much more to unpack in his life because he started the first rural branch of the NAACP right here in Falls Church. And he was a renowned author, writing the first chronicling of African-American participation in athletics, as well as the Negro in sports at the behest of the father of black history, Carter G. Woodson. So, uh, and not only that, but he was a great guy. Uh, um, we spent a lot of time together. We lived under the same roof for 12 years, the end of his life. Uh, and uh, one thing happened at the very end, um, when my grandfather passed, uh, there was a voice that came to me and said I needed to go see my grandfather who was in the hospital there at Tuskegee. And when I got there, um, he took his last breath and, um, and passed. And um, so I feel an affinity um, to my grandfather. I feel that he's still with me and... Um, I think that by keeping his name alive, I'm keeping him alive, you know, and um, the ancestors, our ancestors. So let me get to our uh, presentation. Um, my book is entitled The Grandfather of Black Basketball, The Life and Times of Dr. E.B. Henderson. And it's doing very well, actually. Uh, it was first, uh, the first published, the publishing date was February 20th. And so I've been checking Amazon, you know, and uh, it was it was published on the 20th, and on the 21st there was a little orange sign by it said, "Number one new release," <laughs> you know, and so <laughs> and so I'm very encouraged by that. But uh, we'll we'll see how things go because it's always up and down, up and down depending on how sales go. So I'm going to go ahead and get on with the presentation. Let's see. All right, this picture right here uh, is where E.B. Henderson was born, 471 School Street, and right on in his own handwriting it says birthplace, 471 School Street. 
Now, many of you who aren't familiar with Southwest Washington, D.C., it's just a one-block street. And fortunately, it was not in the pathway of 395. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there at all. There's a picture of the little guy there with the hat standing next to his mother. That's E.B. Henderson. And um, Louisa, his mother, taught him to read and write at a very young age. And when they went to Pittsburgh, he would, um, there was a teacher in the fourth grade that would pay him a quarter, which was a quarter of a day's salary, to read to her students while he was in, like, first grade. This is a young picture of uh, my grandfather. And um, there, was a, there was a testimonial when he retired, and uh, one gentleman said that he always thought of my grandfather as a Clark Gable in sepia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, after going to Harvard and gaining, well, no, he attended the uh, M Street School in Washington, D.C. It's still there, but there's been an effort to change the names of a lot of the schools, which uh, historically is a shame because they have association with African-American history. So in a way, they're re erasing African-American history, which I really, I really feel very badly about. Um, M Street is still there. Uh, you know, when you come out of the tunnel and turn on New York Avenue, the first street after you turn to the right is M Street, and you can see the school right there. The other school right there is the palatial uh, um, Dunbar High School. And I wish they'd never gotten rid of that building, you know. Uh, even though I love the new building that they've done, um, I think that uh, it's just so classic. Uh, I wish they had kept it. And he spent his career basically uh, at Dunbar. He actually was over all of the schools because uh, he went to Harvard um, in 1904 where he, um, he went there to get certification to be, to be a teacher to teach physical education. And um, he was the first African-American male to earn a certification to teach physical education in the United States. Uh, the person that encouraged him to go was his teacher at M Street and then at Minor Teachers College, Anita Turner. Um, she was probably, if not, uh, the first African-American woman, the earth first African-American period, to be certified to teach physical education in the United States. <laughs> no noticing some of the things in the box here is his graduation program um, from Minor Teachers College, or as, or as they called it, Normal school number two. He graduated number one in his class. Normal school number two was for African Americans. Normal school number one was for whites. At Harvard, this is his class photo. He's up in the, uh, let's see, nope, hold on. How do you get the pointer to work? Um, pointer? Red button? I don't see a red button. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's see. I can't see it. Okay. Hit that red line. See the middle and hold it. Okay. There you go. That's him right there. Now, uh, the first year he he had he 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 had to work. Um, he wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Both of his parents were born in slavery. And uh, basically were working class. Um, and so when he went to Harvard, he had to go during the summer sessions because he had to work during the regular year. And uh, so he spent three summer sessions at Harvard. And here he is. Uh, where are we going? Right there on the back row. The second summer, he was also on the back row. The third year... Uh, they invited him to sit among the, his, his classmates uh, when he was going to graduate. And he attended the Dudley Sargent School of Physical Education, actually School of Physical Training. Um, and Dudley Sargent was uh, a, one of the people associated with 
the Springfield College where the, ba- the game of basketball was first um, created. And so the person that taught my grandfather was a person who actually learned from the inventor of the sport, um, James Naismith. And then there's Nellie. I understand that there is a woman here who was a student at James Lee when Nellie Henderson was the principal. Now, and I, I, I appreciate your coming. Thank you. Uh, this is Nellie, or as we know her here, Mary Ellen Henderson. I just decided that if they're going to put a build a school in her honor, that they should use her proper name rather than her nickname, Nellie. And everyone knew her at James Lee as Miss Nellie. But so uh, forgive me for in, 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 um, insisting on her using her proper name. But Nellie, or Mary Ellen, was, uh, her parents were middle class. Father was a lawyer. Mother was uh, one of the first teachers at the preparatory school for Negro children in Washington, D.C., which was the predecessor to M Street and Dunbar High School. And um, she met my grandfather, even though they were in the same class at, uh, they weren't in the same class, but they were at the same time, they were at Dunbar, at M Street. Um, They met for the first time at um, uh, Minor Teachers College. And then, (laughs) let's see. Let's move on. Okay, uh, after returning from Harvard, my grandfather started the first athletic league, the Interscholastic Athletic Association, and then um, they organized a a track meet at Howard University, which was the first event uh, under the auspices of his league. But this group here was the Games Committee, and they actually started meeting a year before, in 1905. This games committee became the Eastern Board of Officials, which was the first organization of African Americans to train officials, referees, timekeepers. The officials is much more broader than just referees. Uh, and then to organize them so that they could uh, um, officiate the competitions between African-American games and things. But he also started a very aggressive intramural program within the schools, everything from elementary school up to high school. Every school had a team, and they organized competitions, and they played against each other uh, within the school system. Okay, this is the um, this is about the colored basketball world championship. After losing, okay, they started the um, championship. The New York team started a league, the Olympian Athletic League, uh, the year after E.B. started his league uh, in 1907. And um, after that, the gentleman to your right there, um, they wanted to start a championship series to see who's the best. The New York teams are the Eastern uh, Seaboard. And so, you know, they started the championship series so that African Americans would have a championship to aspire to. And they named that championship the Colored Basketball World Championship. Now, here's EB, of course. This gentleman here, uh, Mr. Lattimore, I think it's... um, George Lattimore, and then there's this gentleman here, Conrad Norman. Uh, Lattimore was uh, over the uh, group called the Smart Set of Brooklyn, and uh, Conrad Norman was over a group called the Alpha Physical Culture Club. (laughs) Now, these were athletic clubs, you know, within the black community in New York City, and the first year two years, the smart set of Brooklyn won the Colored Basketball World Championship. 
Um, but their star player wanted to be a doctor. And so where did he come to school? Howard University. And when that happened, my grandfather said, oh, come on now, you're here with us. You're going to play with us now. And they went the next two years undefeated, beating all the teams in New York. <laughs> this is the Washington 12th Streeters. Um, they were formed under the auspices of the 12th Street YMCA. Um, the, the cornerstone for the 12th Street YMCA was laid in 1908. Soon after that, they started this team. And one of their, um, uh, all, most of the proceeds from their winning went to the building of the 12th Street YMCA. Okay? But this is the team that my grandfather, um, uh, he started, he captained, he coached this team. And this gentleman here, this is the doctor I was telling you about, uh, Hudson Oliver, who came to Howard and then played for this team here, the Washington 12th Streeters. A little story behind this is that uh, after they won the championship at the beginning of the the beginning of the um, the second season. Uh, there was a game at uh, a casino in New York on, on Christmas Day. And um, my grandfather had promised my grandmother that once they were married, he would no longer play because she was concerned for his safety. And he said, you're not going to be gallivanting all around the country playing basketball when I'm raising the family. And she was going to have to give up her job as a teacher in Washington, D.C. once she was married as well. So if she was going to have to give up something, so would he. And so they got married on Christmas Eve at the 15th Street Presbyterian Church, my grandmother's church. And then accommodations were always paid for by the host team. So the travel and the stay there in New York was covered by the team that they were playing. I think they were playing uh, the Alpha Physical Culture Club. And so they decided that since all of the accommodations were paid for, we'll spend our honeymoon in New York. <laughs> and so that's what they did. And then when they came back, <laughs> they moved in with, his, with my grandfather's parents and grandmother here in Falls Church. Um, they moved to Falls Church because they wanted to raise a family in a quieter environment away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Uh, and on the right there, that's their marriage certificate. All of these are things that are in that box. Shortly after um, my grandfather's last game, or actually about the same time, my grandfather had been writing uh, a guy named James Sullivan, who was over the um, Spalding Handbooks. And um, I have the letters from them uh, to my grandfather. Which, and in 1909, there was one letter that said, sure, we will publish your annual, and it won't cost you a dime. Okay? And that was because there was about 20-some pages of ads for Spalding in, in the handbook. So it was really a, a, um, a nice marketing tool for them. Uh, but James Sullivan was also the person over the AAU, the American Athletic Union. And one of the reasons that EB started his own league, he was encouraged to start his own league by James Sullivan because they weren't going to allow his teams, black teams, to play against white teams. And so therefore, if you want a league, you have to make one for your own race. And so James Sullivan was quite a guy, um, good or bad, I'm not sure. But um, because my grandfather went to Harvard, he was able to make these connections and, um, and get these opportunities to do the things that he did.
And uh, as you can see, uh, it's not just a Washington, D.C. league, but it's the Interscholastic Athletic Association of Middle Atlantic States, which included places like Philadelphia, Atlantic City, um, Richmond, Baltimore, and other teams and other places. And if you had a team, you could join. It wasn't like it was a high school or a college or things like that. But my grandfather was also there at the beginning of the first intercollegiate league, the CIAA, or as, as it was known then, the Colored Interscoll Intercollegiate Athletic Association. They just had their tournament up in Baltimore last week. But now they go by the Central uh, Intercollegiate Athletic Association because color is no longer in vogue. In 1911, uh, E.B. Um, wrote an article in the summer edition of the Crisis Magazine entitled The College Colored Athlete. Um, and of course, you know, uh, the Crisis Magazine was edited by W.B. Du Bois. And so he had an association with W.B. Du Bois through his writing of this article. And one of the things that he writes about in this article, uh, and I wish I could er, er, say it verbatim, it's about right here. Um, it says, I, I can actually see it. When competent physical directors and equal training facilities are afforded the colored youth, the white athlete will, fi will, ha will find an equal or superior in every, in nearly every line of athletic endeavor. That was actually a bold statement. And uh, I think that he felt that that was true in almost any area of endeavor as well. That during segregation, uh, separate was not equal. Um, and that once equal was equal, opportunities and equal facilities were afforded African Americans in whatever endeavor, that there would be those that um, make their way to the top and were not just equal, but maybe even superior to many of their counterparts. But in 1911, that was a pretty bold statement. In 1913, my grandparents built this home, which is now on South Maple Avenue, and uh, I took possession of that in 93. And uh, when they purchased it, it was a Sears kit house from the Sears Roebuck catalog, 1911 catalog, model 225. <laughs> they spent a whopping sum of $1,400. That's for the house now. Okay, but Sears did that. I mean, they sold houses to people. And if you had a lot to build it on, you could buy a house, they would ship it to you, and you could build it or have someone else build it, but you could be a homeowner. That, that house still exists. Little did they know, though, that soon after they built that house that things would happen here in Falls Church uh, that were threatening their home ownership, such as this ordinance. Um, which is the basis of the whole Tenor Hill history that we've been um, promoting for the last almost 30 years. Whereas the town had passed an ordinance that would have restricted blacks from certain areas of town. Um, now, basically, uh, some people say that was housing, but no, it was land ownership. And it was also like sundown towns, there were four um, areas, districts, that the town had made. And it was like, uh, if you were black, you better not be found in those areas after sundown. You know, it was whites only. Whereas this one district, which was about 5% of the land mass, if you were black and wanted to stay in Falls Church, you had to move to that area of town or move out of town, one of the two. And the town council passed that in January of 1915, but they also put it to the citizens of Falls Church through a referendum vote. 
And I think if you look here, there's two things. Uh, first, segregation of races within the town, yes or no. And two, uh, change, it's a tax uh, authority to increase the maximum rate of taxation. No one likes that either. But uh, the thing that African Americans definitely did not like was number, two, number one. Okay, shortly after, uh, there was a lot of activity by the group called the Colored Citizens Protective League, which was founded in opposition to the ordinance. And, um, you know, there was uh, a number of initiatives that uh, were, uh, that they um, found themselves uh, active in protesting against. And uh, this is a transcription of a letter. I don't have the actual letter, but this was in the book, um, The History of the Fairfax County NAACP. And um, some night when you're peacefully dreaming in your downy couch of the charming baboons you have been instructing and smiling in the light uh, odor exuding from their bodies, you'll be rudely awakened by ghosts. Taken to either side of your couch and after you've been gagged, you'll be born to a tree nearby, tied, stripped, and given 30 lashes to your Ethiopian back and left to be found by some passers-by. But I think what's really telling is this. We're for law and order just as oh long as you have to Ethiopians behave. You had better consult with your advisors at W and V and Virginia Washington and Virginia Railroad officials and say to them that you will be not be their cat's paw. Also, there were, there were many letters like this. There was a cross burned in the yard in front of the house. Uh, there, was a, there was a lady whose name was also E. Henderson, and she received some of those letters as well. And according to her daughter, she, she said she would, open that and she would say, they don't need to see this. And, they, and she would tear it up. <laughs> but yeah, it was dangerous. What they were doing was dangerous. And they were taking their lives and their livelihoods in their own hands to stand up against injustice. And that's what the uh, history of the Tenor Hill uh, story is all about. Um, but not only that, but they were advocating within all of Northern Virginia, even though they're, they're when they got a, in a, um, a branch of the NAACP, it was the Falls Church and Vicinity NAACP. And a lot of the other communities in Fairfax were wondering, what about us? Well, they never thought of themselves as just a Falls Church branch. And so they worked hard to bring people into the fold. They started a, before 1922, they started an Arlington branch, an Alexandria branch, a um, Leesburg branch, okay? Because there were no county branches then. These were associated with, with towns or cities. Did I do something wrong? Okay. All right. Uh, additionally, another backlash was eminent domain. And eminent domain was has been used pretty prominently until about 1960. Uh, but this one in particular was supposedly the straightening out of a road in 1922. Uh, what you'll find is that uh, every 50 years after the Civil War, there's a celebration, and particularly by those that uh, are um, Confederate sympathizers. And um, there was a big push to create a Robert E. Lee Highway from coast to coast. And uh, I have a flyer that's probably even more telling of a mass meeting that was to take place about the communities which this highway would go through. And if you look at this map closely, this is in Falls Church. 
And I had this map for years, and I really didn't know what it was until one day I looked at it and I said, aha. The light went off, and I figured out what it was. If you look at here, okay, Henderson, 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 Henderson. Okay, so if, if, if this side is Henderson and this side is Henderson, then, then this here in the middle where the road is must have been Henderson also. <laughs> so it's pretty obvious this is, <laughs> this is a, an example of eminent domain where they took uh, African-American property in order to build a road through and dedicated in honor of the Confederate general that would have kept them in slavery, which is a double insult, I think. And he kept coaching, and uh, this is in front of uh, Dunbar High School. This is the 1922 championship team of Dunbar High School. And I don't know if you know this gentleman here, but that's Charles Drew, who's known for um, blood bank. Uh, and in actually discovering blood plasma by breaking it down. And by that, he was able to cross between different blood types. Now, um, I have a letter from Charles Drew to my grandfather as well, where he talks about how anything that he's done in his life worthwhile, he got from the example of my grandfather, E.B. Henderson. And um, Charles Drew, in the beginning, um, after he graduated from Amherst, where he was a four-letter man, um, he was the athletic director at Morgan College, which is now Morgan State University. Um, and he built that program there before going to uh, McGill uh, and, f and doing the uh, extremely important work that he did uh, for science. My grandfather became the director of physical education, health, and safety in 1926. And uh, through that, he, he took over basically from Anita Turner, who encouraged him to go to Harvard and get his certification. And uh, he worked there until 1954, which uh, was 50 years he gave to the Washington, D.C. colored school system because it was all segregated then. Actually, Washington, D.C. did change there and did integrate in 1954 like the Supreme Court had ordered. But here in Virginia, that was a different story. The Negro in Sports, um, this was the first scholarly book that was done on uh, African-American participation in athletics. And he wrote this at the behest of the father of black history, Carter G. Woodson. He asked him to write this book. Um, <laughs> they worked together to edit it. And my grandfather, you know, uh, disagreed with a lot of what Carter G. Woodson said because he said, basically, what you want, Carter, you know, nobody's going to read that book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it the way that I want. And he actually won out, fortunately. And this was one of the, um, other than uh, Carter G. Woodson's book, uh, The Miseducation of the Negro. The Negro in Sports was one of the best-selling books um, published by the Associated Publishers, which was uh, the publishing arm of Carter G. Woodson's um, organization, the Association for the Study of African American History and Culture. As well as uh, being involved in protest in Falls Church and in Virginia, he was also very active in the NAACP in Washington, D.C. And on many, on many years, he was held uh, leadership positions in both branches. Um, the picture to your left is a picture of them picketing the National Theater. And if you look closely, oop, hold on, wrong. There's E.B. right there uh, with the poster, with the um, picket sign. And here he was part of the, he was the only black part of the Federal Security Agency. And the Federal Security Agency started a committee in Washington, D.C., opening up um, recreation, and there were parks that were restricted. There were facilities that were restricted 
It's like 1937 during, you know, the Depression and during um, the New Deal years. And uh, he would write about what the committee was doing in the Evening Star <laughs> to, uh, to help people to know what was going on. When he retired, he wrote this uh, an eight-part expose in the African American, um, which I used heavily for my book because I figured it was very important to cite him um, saying what happened rather than for me to uh, narrate and, and pontificate on what he said. And on many things that he said was different from what other people had written, such as uh, in Bob Cuska's book, Hot Potato, um, Bob Cuska said that he introduced the sport of basketball in 1907. But in, this, um, in these articles, he actually says, I introduced the sport in 1904. So who do you believe? Okay. Uh, E.B. also started the first, okay, the American Asso Alliance for the Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance is the Physical Education Association, National Association for Physical Educators. But they wouldn't allow blacks in until 1954 when my grandfather started the first chapter in Washington, D.C. in 1954 for African Americans to join. And a lot of it had to do with a lot of the uh, people in the association were from the southern states. And therefore, they did not want to integrate or desegregate their association. Um, E.B. was also the state uh, president of the Virginia Council of NAACPs in 1955 after Brown versus Board of Education. And he worked with Spotwood Robinson and, and many of the other lawyers fighting massive resistance here in the state of Virginia. And then in um, 1960, uh, the push here in Fairfax County to desegregate started with this suit against, um, against the Fairfax County plan where they would integrate one grade at a time <laughs> starting in 1960 until all the grades would be desegregated. Well, the federal judge said that's not good enough. And so uh, my grandfather and the NAACP and the Fairfax County Citizens Association, they started doing pupil placement and placing students into the schools. And then in 1965, um, there became federal money that was uh, given out to school systems if they integrated. And so that's when Fairfax County decided, oh, okay, we need that money. Let's go ahead and, and desegregate. Okay. Uh, 1965, um, <laughs> my grandfather and my grandmother decided that they would move to live with uh, my family uh, in a much, um, in Tuskegee, Alabama. Now, this is um, their 50th wedding anniversary in 1960. And of course, who is that guy right there? <laughs> okay. This is these are my the mother and father, my siblings, my uncle. And then um, in the Evening Star, uh, there was an article, Old Warrior Against Segregation Leaving Field at 82. And what did he do in Tuskegee but start another branch of the NAACP? <laughs> uh, and then, um, okay, there was a, 39 and the 49 edition of the Negro in Sports. And then in 1969, actually 68, I think, uh, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History did an encyclopedic um, uh, series of many volumes. And the one on uh, athletics, they asked my grandfather to do. And they called that one the Black Athlete. And um, hmm, that slide doesn't have his name on it, but I had to look on that one. But he decided that you know so much had happened since '49 uh, that he would need some assistance. So he had a uh, a group of uh, well, a magazine called um, 
Uh, does it say? No. He had help. He insisted that he would need some help at his age of, you know, almost uh, 90 years old. And in 1974, he was inducted into the inaugural class of the Black Athletes Hall of Fame, along with Muhammad Ali and Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain, Jim Brown, and the like. But his real... He always had an affinity for Highland Beach, Maryland, where he was actually a member, or he was actually the chair of the committee to incorporate the town in 1922. Uh, And he would, uh, as you can see here, um, this is classic, okay? Uh, During the summer months, he would put his um, bench out here, and he would sit on the shore where the Black Walnut Creek entered the Chesapeake Bay, and he had the longest surf poles I've ever seen. And he would sit there on the, he would stand there on the shore, cast out into the Chesapeake Bay, and bring in the bigger fish than I would see people coming back in boats or from the pier. And here's his home uh, that he named Loafing Holt after a line in a Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem. Um... And actually, Paul Lawrence Dunbar had one of the lots on the on the waterfront at Highland Beach as well. But he he, he died before he had an opportunity to uh, to build. Okay, um, I'm not going to play this, uh, but the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame. Uh, we 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 did something very different. We had to think outside the box because the first year we created a 138-page document, and um, we we got in touch with the archivist up there, and he said, "Well, nobody knew who he was, but yet they they had written him in his last years asking for a copy of his book. Otherwise, they could not tell the story of blacks in basketball." They said, "Well." Um, we decided that since no one would take the time to read a 138-page document, we made a seven-minute video, burned 28 DVDs, and sent that up there. And then the following year, we, did, uh, we added to that DVD uh, footage we got from the Today Show, Today Show with Brian Gumble interviewing Arthur Ashe. And uh, Arthur Ashe asked him, well, why would you do this subject, uh, Arthur? Surely this has been done before. And he said, yes. The first one to do it was uh, Edwin Henderson, um, a, a gym teacher in Washington, D.C. And so we added that, and we sent that up there. Still, it took eight years. But, you know, we started to get some traction. And um, in 2013, uh, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. In 2010, though, uh, how many of you are familiar with the flashback cartoons? A lot of them uh, are uh, in the Washington Post. And in 2010, this one, they did a series of four for Black History Month in 2010. And uh, this one in particular, I really like. I think it, it, uh, but there's four others, the three others, and... um, I really like the visual part of this to help tell the story. And then also in 2010, we did a conference, uh, my wife and I, uh, on the emergence and legacy of African-American basketball. And we worked with the uh, National Museum of African-American History and Culture before they had the building. the National Y, or YMCA, and Howard University to put on this program. And you you might know that this is also the cover of my book, which was a, uh, I really love this photo, this this painting of my grandfather that was done by Mark Chiarillo, who did a series of Negro League baseball cards in the 70s. And uh, he's given us great latitude in using it. (laughs) And then in uh, 2013, as I said, we got him into the Basketball Hall of Fame. 
Okay, uh, there's a historic marker that was put in front of the house at 307 Maple Street, South Maple Street. And it was done by a elementary school. The wording was done by an elementary school student in a uh, contest that was put on by the uh, governor of Virginia. And it's very concise. If you ever get a chance, you, you go by and look at it. It's very well done. I really like that there's a Virginia historic mark in front of the house. And then uh, last year, the University of District of Columbia unveiled, well, they named their gymnasium, their sports complex, in honor of my grandfather, but they also got the um, Brian Hanlon to uh, build a statue of my grandfather in front of the complex. And Brian Hanlon is the one who does all of the uh, Basketball Hall of Fame um, statues and others too. Okay, that's it.